Thank you, Sam. Thank you, worship team. Um, I, I hope that your great desire is to hear from the Lord. Amen? Yeah, I, I hope that, I mean, I know your pastor looks good and all, and you want to see him every Sunday, right? Because he's got hair? Yeah, amen. But uh, just kidding. You come to hear from the Lord. You, you, don't, you, don't, you don't come to hear from Travis. You, you come to hear from the Lord. And, and what you, see, you don't, you don't know, we probably enter into a contract every week, don't we? Right? We enter into a contract with one another, whether we know that or not. And, and the contract is this, you, you trust that I meet with the Lord, I trust that you meet with the Lord, and then I trust that we come together as the family of Jesus to praise and to adore him together, and that in that the Holy Spirit will speak to us and through us and empower us. Amen? You say, I didn't sign up for that. Oh, yeah, you did. Oh, you did. Yeah. The, the moment that you placed your faith and belief and trust in Jesus you entered into that agreement, right? You say, well, well hold on a second. What, what, about the Christians? what about the Christians who don't partake in the fellowship or don't come to the table? Well, maybe they didn't read the fine print of the contract. I'm not sure, right? But, but the whole point is this. The whole point is that we are to come together to exalt his name together. Did you know that this faith that we are called to and this family that we're called to It is communal. You know what that means? It means that we are in this thing together. We're in it together. Jesus didn't say, when you pray, pray my Father. What did he say? Our Father. Because he wanted his family to be reminded every single day that we are in this together. We are a family, the family of Jesus. You say, where is that in the message? I don't know. That's just what the Lord wanted me to tell you right in this moment today. So go to 2 Kings. We are looking at a resurrection story. Now, if you remember last week, we, we stopped. And by the way, wasn't that a sweet time in service last week? Just incredible of just, I mean, just seeing the body encourage the body. Praying over, laying hands prophesying over. Those are the exact things that the Apostle Paul instructs us to do. And so I love, thank you, church, that, that we were able to fan into flame the gift of God, as 1 Timothy says. 2 Timothy, sorry, that one's second. Yeah, uh, as, as 2 Timothy says, that Paul says that we're to do to one another. And so um, just thank you. Thank you for writing on those cards, the intercessory prayers. Know that we prayed over those this week, and we're going to be going through, and I'm, I'm, I'm sending those to the staff each, uh, each day or every other day where we pray and intercede and lift up those. So those just didn't get written on paper, and then they just woof, vamooshed, okay? They, they truly, we truly are praying over those, uh, all those requests, all those intercessory prayers, and thank you for those words of encouragement um, to our staff. Thank you, thank you um, so much. It was a sweet time, wasn't it? Okay, about two of you thought it was sweet. Okay, that's good. All right, it was good. Thank you. Okay, Second Kings 4. Um, we're going to pick up, remember, Second uh, Kings 4 verse 18 is where we're going to be. Uh, so we're in this series uh, called Double Portion, the study of Elisha. And if you remember, we kind of just did the the beginning of the story, part one last week. Um, And and so what it was, was simply, let me recap that, was simply that this uh, this wealthy woman from Shunem and her husband recognized that uh, Elisha, as he was coming by the way, because it would be on the path from where he lived at Mount Carmel to Jezreel and some of the other places where he had schools of prophecy, so uh, basically like theological schools that he would go and check on and oversee because Elisha was the main, the head prophet uh, of Israel at this time, okay? And so he would do that, so he would frequent by this village called Shunem. Well, this woman saw that this was a man of God, saw maybe Elisha's reputation had preceded him, and she, in her hospitality, um, she said to her husband, we need to offer him um, a meal, and then we need to offer him a place to stay, and it said that they, they actually made a room. It was like the first Airbnb. Two of you got it. Okay. It was the first Airbnb, right? And so they put up, they put up a, it says a bed, actually great description, a bed, a table, a lamp, and that way he, and a chair, I think. 
maybe. You can look at it. But anyway, it's all there. And so that's where he stayed. And, and because of this hospitality, Elisha says, uh, calls his servant Gehazi and says, hey, call, call her in. Is there something that we can do in return to bestow kindness upon her? Because she has been so kind to us. She's been very hospitable. So what, what, you know, what can we do? And um, so, so she comes and and um, can we speak a word for you? Can we, can we intercede for you? Can we speak to the commander or the king? Okay, because Elisha has great position and power. So he offers to do that. She says, no, my family takes care of me. My people take care of me. I'm, you know, I'm with my own people. And so he's like, okay, well, surely there's something. So Elisha and Gehazi talk a little bit more. And Gehazi says, well, she doesn't have a son. And her husband's old. So uh, he says, well, bring her back. And then he says... At this time next year, you're going to have a child. And she says, Lord, don't, don't trick me. My Lord, don't trick me. Don't, don't play games with me. Don't get my hopes up, right? And sure enough, it came to pass. Now we pick up the story in verse 18. So this is a few years later. Um, some commentators think about seven years later. Uh, when the child had grown, he went out one day to his father among the reapers. And he said to his father, oh, my head, my head. The father said to his servant, carry him to his mother. And when he had lifted him and brought him to his mother, the child sat on her lap till noon, and then he died. And he went up and he laid on the bed of the man of God and shut the door behind him and went out. Then she called to her husband and said, send me one of the servants and one of the donkeys that I may quickly go to the man of God and come back again. And he said, why will you go see him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. She said, all is well. Literally, she said shalom, if you know the Hebrew word shalom, peace, all is well, it's good. Uh, Then she saddled the donkey, and she said to her servant, urge the animal on, do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When the man of God saw her coming, so that's Elisha, he's looking out, he sees her coming. He said to Gehazi, verse 25, look, there's the Shunammite, run at once to meet her and say to her, is all well with you? Is all well with your husband? Is all well with the child? And she answered, all is well. Again, shalom. All is well. And when she came to the mountain to the man of God, she caught hold of his feet, and Gehazi came to push her away. But but the man of God said, leave her alone, for she is in bitter distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. Then she said, did I ask my Lord for a son? Did I not say, do not deceive me? He said to Gehazi, tie up your garment and take my staff in your hand and go. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, do not reply and lay my staff on the face of the child. Then the mother of the child said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was no sound or sign of life. Therefore, he returned to meet him and told him, the child has not awakened. Verse 32, when Elisha came into the house, he saw the child lying dead on his bed. So he went in and he shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Then he went up and lay on the child, putting his mouth on his mouth his eyes on his eyes, and his hands on his hands, and he stretched himself upon him, and the flesh of the child became warm. Then he got up again and walked once back and forth in the house and went up and stretched himself upon him. The child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. Then he summoned Gehazi and said, call this Shunammite. So he called her. And when she came to him, he said, pick up your son. She came and fell at his feet, bowing to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. Let's pray. Father God, would you bless and honor the reading of your word today as we dive in? God, would you give us ears to hear as we talked about what you want us to hear? We want to hear from you today, O God. Would you give us a mind of understanding, Holy Spirit, for we cannot understand apart from your enlightenment O oh, Holy Spirit, and would you give us a heart willing to obey, God? Would these be your words today? Would you minister to your people, Holy Spirit? We ask this in the authority in the name of Jesus. Amen. So do you see, uh, first of all, is this a crazy story? Yes. Let's just go ahead and say, is it a little weird? Absolutely. I mean, Elisha's spreading himself out, arms to arms, 
Like, you know, is this CPR? <laughs> it's weird, okay? It's just a weird story all the way around. But I hope you kind of get the gist of it. Is So she didn't ask for this son. Seven years later, he's out in the field with dad, has a headache, um, sends him in, and dies in mom's arms. She immediately takes him up to Elisha's room, the upper room up there that they made for him, and puts him on Elisha's bed that he would stay in. And then she says to her husband, please get the donkey and the servant ready for me. I am going to go see the man of God. The husband says, hold on a second. It's, it's, not, it's not Sabbath, and it's not a festival, so why would we be consulting him? I mean, what, why are you going to bother him? And it's interesting because she doesn't tell her husband that the child's dead. She doesn't come out and say that. She says, just get me the donkey, just give me the servant, let's go. She tells the servant, don't slacken your pace. Basically, you keep him at a good trot. We've got to get there, okay? And so basically tells the servant to keep prodding the donkey the whole way. Now, this distance is about 20 miles, and so donkey journey, probably three to four hours, okay? And so it says by noon, right? So I just want you to get the timeline here, okay? So she doesn't, she's not arriving to see Elisha till later, almost dusk, okay? And then Elisha sees the woman from far off, says to Gehazi, I think that's the Shunammite, go see, go intervene, go check and see what's going on, right? And she totally just ignores Gehazi and says, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you what's going on. Shalom. I'm, I'm going on. And she goes and she falls and it says that she grips. It's a very strong word. It says that she lays hold and grips the man of God at his feet. That's Elisha's feet and says, did I ask for a son? In other words, I didn't ask for this gift you gave it and promised it. I told you not to get my hopes up, and now he is dead. Elisha, he starts to get disturbed and distressed at this point. She's distressed, but he starts to get bothered as well. He says, I don't know what's going on. The Lord hasn't revealed it to me. And, 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 and so uh, he sends Gehazi on with the staff to lay on the boy. And then the mom says, hey, I'm not going anywhere. She's not going to go with the Hazi, the servant. She's going to stay right there with Elisha. In fact, that's where she makes this strong de declarative statement in verse 30. I will not go anywhere if you don't go with me. Does that sound familiar? Right? Moses, God, if you don't go with us, I'm not going. Right? And so she says, hey, I'm not going anywhere. I, I, I want you to go with me. And so they go on. Gehazi comes back at some point while they're on their journey back to Shunem. And Gehazi says, it's not working. The staff did nothing. The boy's still dead. Elisha and, and the Shunemite persist on. He goes into the room. He walks into the room. He closes the door behind him. And then it says that he prays. He prays to the Lord. And then he does this weird thing of stretching out. And it says the body became warm, but he did not come back to life. Then it says he paces the room back and forth. He does it again. The boy sneezes seven times and says, call the Shunammite, pick up your son. And what does she do again? She falls at his feet and grips them again in thankfulness and praise. So you say, pastor, what do you make out of this whole story? This is a little weird. This is a little crazy. But the first thing I want you to see, and you can write this down, is desperation. This woman is desperate. Desperation. You ever been in a desperate situation? You ever had an emergency? You ever had a tragedy where something, an accident happened, something befell, something um, just that you did not anticipate happened, and you find yourself in a desperate situation, that is exactly what she found herself in. And w when we are in a point of desperation, whether it's the, 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 the passing of a loved one, the sudden passing of a loved one, whether it's um, uh, maybe a, our child has been diagnosed with a, with a chronic illness, Maybe you have been diagnosed with a chronic illness. 
These are points of desperation. Maybe you lost your job and you don't know where the next check's going to come from. You don't know how you're going to put food on the table. You're not sure where the next meal is coming from. Would we not all agree that these are points of desperation for us? Desperation. We have various points, and for each person, your desperation's a little bit different probably from somebody else's desperation, right? Maybe for you, you're desperate for a relationship to be restored. We all have points where we are desperate, and we have desperation. What I love about this woman and the, what we see here that's so incredible is she threw off decorum. You say, what's decorum? Ooh, that's a word. She threw off tradition. She told, she said, I'm going to go see the man of God. I don't care if it's Thursday. I don't care if it's Tuesday. I don't care if it's Monday. I'm desperate for God, and I'm going to go. See, (laughs) until you get to that point where you are willing to throw off whatever custom or tradition, or you get to the point, the better way to say it would be this, till you get to the point where you no longer worry about what other people think. And hear me, God has a way of getting us to that point where you, you're no longer, you're not worried about what other people think. And I don't know if you've ever been there, but if you've ever been there, you know what I'm talking about. You just want to hear from the Lord. You just want to go from Him, you go to Him in desperation. You just want to cry out to Him like David cried out in the psalm, God, where are you? That's what this woman, that was the cry of her heart, God, where are you? She was desperate. When you're desperate, you throw off customs and norms and tradition. In fact, Gehazi was offended when she came and clung to the feet. That, you didn't do that. You, you, you didn't, you, a woman didn't come and cling to the feet, right? And certainly not some, a prophet of God. And so he rushes right over there. Get, 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 get away, get away. And that's why, that's why Elisha said, no, no, she's in bitter distress, and the Lord hasn't revealed what's going on here. Right? But she showed her absolute desperation. Have you ever been there where you just show your absolute desperation? For you, it might be screaming in the car in the middle of the day. You might be driving down North Street. Now, I'm not because the person in front of you just cut you off or because an F-250, a white F-250, just turned on 25 off of 2505 North Street. That'd be me, so sorry. Uh, but, but, but you're not screaming in, at, at the top of your lungs because of that. You're screaming at the top of your lungs because you are desperate for God to intervene in your situation. It may be not be that. It may be at the quietness at the pond. And you're crying from the inside of your heart, and maybe words don't even come out, but the Lord knows the groaning of your heart. In fact, it says that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with pleadings and groanings that when we don't even know how to verbalize, when you don't even know how to pray, the Holy Spirit of God intercedes and gives words to the Father on your behalf. And so, points of desperation, you have to get to that. You have to have that point where you are desperate for the Lord. This woman clung to the feet of Elisha. And in fact, so much so, have you ever had other good, well-meaning people come to you and say, well, you see, what you need to do is this, right? (laughs) I was was talking with uh, with one of our deacons uh, uh, last week about Job. Job came up, and uh, we were talking about Job's friends and what a blessing they were. I mean, they just... Bill Dad the shoe height, and it wasn't because he was shoe height, okay? It was because (laughs) that was his name, that's where he's from. But boy, those guys, man, those friends were just, they were not uppers, they were downers. We've talked about that before. You being around a Debbie Downer, every single thing is negative. Every word that comes out is negative, right? That's what Job's friends were, right? And so those guys were just, man, they said, well, Job, well, why don't you just go ahead and, I mean, just curse God and die. That's what his wife said right? She wanted any help either. Oh, you see, and they started conjecturing. And for 25 chapters, they sit there and they just, here's a word, obloviate. They just sit there and just go on and on and pontificate about all the ways that Job has messed up his life. And if he would just repent, if he would just get right with God, then it would all be well. 
right? Now, I'm not saying that those people aren't well-meaning, but there's people that come into your life or interject things into your life and say, and they're, they, I think they're well-meaning, but they just say, well, if you would just do this, it'll all be good, right? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand right now, right? But if you, if you would just do this, well, the situation would just be resolved. If you would just listen to this sermon and you take down those three points, you will have it down and your situation will be resolved. In Jesus' name, right? But you say it's not that simple, right? You say, you don't know what I'm going through like Job. You don't understand. You don't understand the history. You don't understand the baggage, right? And, and, and this, woman, this woman was so desperate, and Gehazi seems to me like one of those well-meaning good friends who always wants to help out, but he doesn't always have the best advice, Right? And so Elisha says, Elisha says, don't, 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 don't. Remember the, disciple, remember the disciples that, that um, wanted to come to, and blind Bartimaeus was crying out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Outside Jericho, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then the disciples go over there and say, shh, 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 shh. We don't talk to the Savior that way. We don't, we don't yell out. We don't do that kind of stuff. No, uh, 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 right? And so Jesus says, hey, no, I'm going to go to him. And he says, what do you want me to do for you? That man was in a point of desperation. And we've talked about this before. You need to verbalize what you want the Lord to do for you. That question does two things. It hones your heart to verbalize what is inside. It makes you focus, what do I really want of the Lord? Is it a material thing? Is it something else? What is, it reveals our priorities when we actually verbalize what we really want and answer that question. And two, it causes us to be specific. You and I need to be specific before the Lord. And so this woman was desperate. But secondly, this is what desperation drives you to. Every single time, every single time when you're desperate, you can write this down, it drives you to dependency. I didn't say dependency upon the Lord, did I? It drives you to a dependency. When you are in a desperate situation, when something has entered into your world, rocked your world, that's out of your control, it will inevitably cause you to a dependency. That may be a dependency on a drink. That may be a dependency on a substance. That may be a dependency on something you watch. That may be a dependency on a relationship, but it will drive you to a dependency. That is what human desperation does every single time. What it drove the Shunammite to was a dependency upon God, a dependency upon Jehovah God. She knew who had given her the son. She knew who had taken the son. And she knew what it would take to intervene. And so she goes to the one. She displays her dependency. She says it to me, this statement that says it all of her dependency, where her hope lies. As the Lord lives, verse 30, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. <laughs> hey, do y'all remember the story? I love Jesus, Jesus and his stories. Didn't he tell the best stories, by the way? He's the best storyteller, okay? He's, he's incredible. But he tells this story on the persistence of prayer. And remember, he talks about that annoying neighbor coming at midnight. Bread, please. I got, I got, I got, I got to serve some folks. Come on, get up, get up, get up, get up out of bed, right? That, 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 that annoying persistence, right? And it says that he gets up and he gives the bread. And there's this beautiful illustration there of when we approach the Father with persistency, with fervency, with frequency, that he is a good Father who longs to give good gifts. And this woman comes desperate, but she comes dependent. See, dependency recognizes when you go to a healthy place of dependency, you recognize Jesus' care and authority over you. When you go to an unhealthy place of dependency, you start to put your hope in a person, in a relationship, in a substance. You hear me? But when you put it in the healthy response is to put it in the response of the only one who can actually intervene into the situation. 
So dependency recognizes Jesus' care and authority over you. By the way, why would you go to someone who doesn't have authority over your situation? Shunammite goes to the person, the sole person who has authority. Elisha represents God. She goes to the man of God, who's re- that's his title repeatedly in here. She goes to the man of God. She goes to God repeatedly because she knows that is who she has to depend on because there's only one person in the situation who has authority over the situation. Why do you and I go to people and places and things that do not carry or have the authority to intervene in our situations? Well, what's the answer? I think many of us know the answer. Because in some cases, we just want to be numb to the situation. We just want the pain to go away. We just want the hurt to go away. We just want to occupy our mind with something other than the pain. This woman lost her seven-year-old son suddenly. You can't depend on someone who doesn't have authority. Why would I go to the judge if he had no authority to issue any kind of sentence in my situation? He's just a figurehead then, right? He's just a placeholder. We don't serve a placeholder. We serve the king of kings, the one who is in authority, the one who is at the right hand, the place of power, the right hand of the almighty God. That is Jesus, your mediator, your intervener, your interceder. And he has, what does he say? He says in Matthew 28, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. And then what does he do? (laughs) Then he gives us the greatest kick in the pants that's ever been given. Now go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, teaching them, right? He says, because I have authority, I now extend that authority to you, and now you go change the world. When we are dependent, we must put our dependency on one who has authority. And when you recognize the one who has authority to intervene, that makes all the difference. Do you know that the word that says that when he went in and he shut the door and it said that Elisha began to pray? So I said, what is this? What is the, what's, the Hebrew, what's the meaning of this Hebrew word? Do you know what the first thing that comes up is? To intervene to make judgment for. Oh, that's, that's a little odd. But look at it in context. Elisha is asking the Lord to intervene into this woman's situation and to make a judgment call on the life of this son. That's what you do, right, when you petition the court. So you may never have viewed prayer this way, but maybe it's helpful for you in this situation to see that he goes and he basically petitions the court. He petitions God and says, God, I'm crying out to you. I'm calling out to you. I know who you are. I know you have authority. I know you let this, you let this happen. I know you allowed it to happen. So, God, I'm asking you, based on who you are and who I am, to intervene in this situation. He has authority to intervene. When we were adopting our boys, I learned of a legal word that I was not aware of before, and it was the word standing. So in the court, if you were to be a participant in the courtroom, if you are going to come into the case, they don't just let anybody stand up and start to speak. You must have standing in the court. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means you have to be an interested party in the court case. And the sad news for us was we were told repeatedly, you don't have any standing. I was like, hold on a second. What do you mean we don't have standing? We're caring for the boys 24-7. I would think that's about as much standing as you can get. No, no, no. But legally, you don't, legally, you have no standing. You see, you're not involved in this case is what we were told. Yeah, I mean, you've got the prosecutor, you've got the defense attorney, and and then you have the the child's attorney. They call them ad litems. You, that, that, that's, that's the players. They get to speak. They have standing. 
right? But you don't have any kind of standing. That's not us. That's not us. Elisha knew when he entered into the courtroom of heaven and he started to pray and he started to beg and he started to cry out, he had standing before the Father. He had the right legally to come in and to ask that of the Lord. Now, hear this. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to you, Jesus says. That's to us, to the disciples, to us, his disciples, his followers. You and I have legal standing before the God of this universe because of the intervention of Jesus. We then have standing and we can come before him. Wow, that's an amen. Woo, I love it. That's good. I got an amen off of that one. Yeah, I don't care how they come. It's all good. Yeah. And so when, when, we, when we come before the courtroom of the Lord, we have standing with Him. How do I know this? Ephesians 1 says that we have been given a position in the heavenlies. We have been seated with Christ in the heavenlies. You've heard me say this before. You've got a spiritual address and an earthly address. You've got two addresses. I can't fully explain it, but the best way is to explain it via a Zoom call. A Zoom call, you can be all meeting together and you're Zooming together or whatever, FaceTiming, whatever you want to do, right? But physically, y'all are not in the same place. But virtually, you're in the same place, right? And so we have a position, a spiritual address seated in the heavenlies, and guess what? It has authority with it. And so Elisha comes now, we have a greater advantage than Elisha. Did you know that? Because we have the Son advocating for us. And so, huh. and guys, it hurt when I was told there was no standing, by the way. I was like, what do you mean there's no standing? Like, we hired an attorney only to get him up there and say, who are you, the judge said. Well, I'm here pleading for, for Travis and Jody Heyman. No. And who are they, right? Well, they, they're, they're, the, they're the foster parents, right? And so and he's like, oh, no, ah, you don't have standing. As a believer in Jesus, you and I never have to experience that. As a follower of Christ, you and I never have to experience the rejection of not having standing in the prayer room. We have standing because of Jesus, the mediator. So we need to ask for intervention in our case. And we need to boldly approach the throne room of grace. Elisha is asking the Lord to render a judgment on this boy's situation, to intercede, to intervene. And then lastly, what we see is this most beautiful thing, and you can write this down, we see deliverance. See, desperation will always lead you to a dependency, okay? <laughs> and then you are going to be delivered somehow, some way. But the best deliverance, the true deliverance, is when the Almighty God moves on your behalf and you experience deliverance. It says, he summoned Gehazi. After, after the boy came back to life, call the Shunammite, verse 36. So he called her, and when she came to him, he said, pick up your son. And she came and fell at his feet. She worshiped the Lord, bowing to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. Now, there begs a question, does there not, in this situation. Why was the miracle progressing? You say, why did it take two, two, three, I think Elijah says three times he prayed to the Lord. Why did it not happen the first time? Why did it not happen with the staff? Right? I mean, we, it's a good question to ask. Why was it not instantaneous, right? And we even see, even in the Gospels, Jesus would speak a word, right? Boom. Right? Or the, or the woman with the issue of blood would reach out, touch the garment, boom, healed. 
right? We see instantaneous healings, but we also see in Mark 8, that there's a two-stage, two-step healing. Remember that? It, it says that there was, a, there was, a, there was a, a blind man, and the friends brought the blind man to Jesus. It's Mark 8, 22, and it says that, um, that they wanted him to heal him. And Jesus spits, on, spits, creates spit, puts it on the eyes, and says, what do you see? And he says, well, I see some figures walking around. They kind of look like trees, and it's a little bit foggy. And he says, okay, does it again, he can see clearly. Why, why, why a two-step? Why a multi-step? Why a progression? Right? And we even see it with Jesus. So I, th- th- this is a question that, that really, really I was asking of the Lord. Why is this? Well, hear me. Jesus' goal is that you would see him more clearly and that you would have greater dependency upon him. And if that's the goal, doesn't it make sense why sometimes the miracles are progressive? Because what's his whole goal? If his whole goal is that you would greater and greater trust, greater trust, greater dependency upon him, with each prayer, with each cry, the goal would be, come closer, come closer to me. Come closer to me. There's also two other things that I think are interesting in this. One, the woman did not ask for the son. So this gift, just like, and I'm comparing this to Mark 8 in the blind man. The blind man didn't come to Jesus asking to to see. The friends brought him. And if you look at this collectively, and you look at the Gospels, and you look at how God responds to his people, speaking of the instantaneous and the miraculous instantly versus progressively, I think you could see that there's a correlation between those who cry out personally with faith and exhibit faith, like the woman reaching out with the issue of blood, what did she do? She reached out to the one who she knew, and she took an action to do it. And she was healed. And in fact, Jesus replies and says, Daughter, your faith has made you well. What am I saying there? I'm saying that there definitely is a correlation to personal faith in the response. Now, where all that lies, I don't know exactly. I'm just saying that no doubt we are called to exhibit a personal faith. And when we, see, when we see those who personally cried out, we don't see a progressive nature when there's a personal cry out to the Lord. Because what do we know? Sam said it earlier. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. That anyone who believes must, come, must be earnest in their faith and must believe. And so... Hey, do I know that with great certainty of why those things are the case? No, those could be a couple of options of the reasons of that. But at the end of the day, what I do know is this. God's goal, Jesus' goal, is that you would exhibit greater dependency, greater dependency, greater dependency. So that may be why the miracle takes a year, two years, three years, five years, a decade. Because he's saying, come close, come close, come close. Get to know my heart. Get to, in, in the midst of the suffering, patience and tribulation, come get to know me. Does that make sense? Okay, maybe I just needed a little bit of feedback there. <laughs> Thank you. But his goal is that we would see him more clearly. Maybe Elisha needed to learn that, that it didn't work the first, like, like, okay, body became warm, but it wasn't complete resurrection. And so he, what does he do? He paces back and forth and prays and cries out to the Lord again and again and again, and then he goes and does it again, right? What does that do? It just brings him closer to the Father's heart. It just brings him closer to knowing God in the mysterious of his ways. 
So I ask you today, and I realize there may be some in here who don't have standing with the Lord. You don't know the Lord. And, and, and because you don't know the Lord, you can't come into the courtroom and have standing before Him because you don't know Jesus. Oh, you know of Him or you know some facts of Him, but you don't personally know Him. You, you've never had a personal experience where you have said, just like the thief on the cross, Lord, have mercy upon me, I am a sinner. And so that might be you today. You say, well, why is it that, that, that my prayers don't seem like, you know, I cry out when, well, when times are good, it's, it's great, but when times are bad and I cry out in desperation and, and, and I really need help with this and it doesn't feel like anything's happening, well, I, would, I would first of all ask you, do you have standing in his court? Do you know Jesus? Because if you don't know Jesus... I can guarantee you, you don't have standing in the court. So that would be a question that I have for you today. Do you truly know him? Have you truly come to a place of desperation because of your sin and you recognize that you have been serving your kingdom and not his? And as a result of that, you want to demonstrate, you want to ask Jesus to forgive you, and you want to give your life to him. That's true dependency. That's what it means. It's your declaration of dependency, not your declaration of independence. Declaration of dependency upon Jesus. And then for, for, some, uh, for some, some of us, we've given up on a prayer that we have been praying for a long time because we haven't seen any deliverance. And I think the lesson today is just keep, keep on. Keep on because you have standing because of Jesus and you keep leaning in. You keep coming in in prayer. You keep asking him. You keep seeking. You keep knocking and you lean in. This is what I always tell people when they say, well, I've been praying for so-and-so to come to know Jesus, to truly know him for years and years. And I would say, well, it's always too soon to give up. It's always too soon to quit on that intercessory prayer. God's working in ways that you can't see. You believe that? He's working in ways you can't see. He's working and he's orchestrating things and he's bringing about situations and he's putting people, loved ones that you love in places of desperation so that they can see that their dependence has to be on the author of life. The one who resurrects. The one who restores. Let's pray.